seconds. Twenty. Good evening. The bomb isn't likely to drop, certainly not in the near future. Although the Russian invasion of Afghanistan has heightened tension between East and West, few believe that a nuclear war is imminent. But what the Afghan crisis has made us do is examine what preparations have been made to enable you and me, as opposed to government, to survive a nuclear attack. Britain's Civil Defence Corps was disbanded in 1968, and since then most people seem to have wanted to avoid the subject altogether. They think either that there'll be no nuclear war, or that no one will survive it. Both assumptions are questionable. In this film, we've attempted to find out how many could survive a nuclear attack, what life would be like after such a catastrophe, and what's being done to help us survive. You may find some of this film disturbing. But as long as we remain a likely target for attack, we must think about the unthinkable if the bomb drops. After a nuclear war, the whole of Europe could become a vast, uninhabitable desert. No industrial society, nothing that we would recognize as government, would survive. There would be a state of total anarchy, with all those who remained alive prey to bands of savage marauders with disease rampant and violent death commonplace. In an all-out nuclear war, to use the word survival is idiotic. The apocalyptic words of General Sir John Hackett, former commander-in-chief of NATO's Northern Army Group. A catastrophe with untold loss of life, an inferno from which there will be no recovery. In the popular mind, if the results of nuclear war are to be so awesomely destructive, there is nothing to be gained by preparing for survival afterwards. For 12 years, civil defense equipment has lain in warehouses gathering dust. So too have fresh thoughts about our survival. If war came tomorrow, most of us would die. With better preparations, most of us could survive. If uh, people were adequately informed and could take adequate preparations, uh, I think you could reduce your casualty level to about 30%. In other words, we'd have something like 65 70% survivors. And it's those people that we've got to do something about. And that's the whole raison d'etre for civil defence. It's no good having weapons to fight for the freedom of the West. And while our boys are dying at the front, the last thought they have is that the people back home are not going to survive either. So what's the point of the whole bloody mess? The belief that the next war will be the last one isn't new. H.G. Wells' 1936 film, Things to Come, reflected contemporary military thinking when it showed the bomber as the ultimate weapon of destruction. Please keep still and listen. War has broken out suddenly. There may be an air raid. The streets will be dangerous. Do not assemble in crowds. Keep indoors. Go home. Those who are far from home can take refuge in the underground railways. Go home. Go home. Go home. Get out of the square. Get out of the streets. Go home and keep home. The film caused panic in the streets. Four years later, when these scenes had become a reality, many of those who took to the shelters did so believing it was the end of civilization. They were wrong. So too was the belief that such powerful weapons could so frighten politicians that war could be prevented.
Today, after Afghanistan, the doomsday clock of the Association of Atomic Scientists stands at seven minutes to midnight, closer to nuclear war than at any time since the two superpowers gained the bomb. The Soviet Union appears to believe that her civil defense program means that most of her people could survive. It's yet another undermining of the delicate balance of terror known as mutually assured destruction. It seems that the Russians do not accept at least the mutual part of assured destruction. Because what mutual assured destruction meant as a theory was that you in a sense bared your breast to the enemy. You took no defensive measures. You accepted the fact that you remained absolutely vulnerable to his attack. And then there would be an element of stability because if he had enough weapons to attack you being vulnerable and you had enough weapons to attack him being vulnerable, there was a, a deterrent mechanism at work. The trouble is the Russians didn't seem to accept this part of the doctrine and so they have developed a substantial civil defense program. They clearly think that they might come to the point of a strategic nuclear exchange and then if that were so they want to lose less badly than the United States. Today the nuclear arsenals are bigger than they've ever been. An average of three tons of high explosive for every man, woman and child on earth. Many would agree that the greater the number of weapons, the greater the chance of their being used. In a small overcrowded island like ours, is there any point in trying to protect ourselves? How many of the missiles might be targeted on Britain? So I think that they would be looking at something like as high as 200 targets in the United Kingdom and perhaps allocating nearly as many as 400 weapons to the destruction of those targets, given that they won't all, all go off or work. So, I mean, if I took a map of the United Kingdom and I put pins in for all the military targets, which I think they would be interested in, there would not be many parts of the United Kingdom which would not have pins in them. On August the 6th, 1945, an American plane dropped a bomb called Little Boy on the city of Hiroshima. Even now, people are dying from the after effects of that explosion. Today, weapons are a thousand times more powerful. The common view is that if we don't all die immediately, radiation will kill us painfully over the years. Bruce Sibley is a scientist who has studied ways of coping with radiation. I can tell you that all of the data in the last three decades convinces me that although there will be catastrophic damage in the cities and that millions of people will die as a result of the initial effects of the weapon and the initial radiation, long term wise, over the, over the decades that we have to survive and build a new society, people will be able to um, grow food on contaminated land and monitor it carefully and keep that level down that goes into the bodies and minimize the number of deaths that will occur over the decades as regards increases in leukemia, cancer, and um, genetic um, births and things like this. I mean, the sort of proportions we're talking about um, are rather similar to what we live with every day of our lives in peacetime. We, we don't worry about deaths on the road. We don't worry about, uh, we don't appear to worry about deaths on the road. We don't appear to worry about accidents in the hospitals, uh, that cases coming into the hospitals, people be, have been killed um, in, in work, um, people who are dying in hospital from smoking, uh, all of these statistics we live with every day of our lives. And yet once we start to talk about nuclear war casualties in the aftermath point, where people are eating contaminated food with radioactivity in it, we start getting very excited because a scientist might say, well, 200 people out of a million who have eaten crops that are contaminated may die of leukemia. These are the facts of nuclear war life being exchanged for the facts that we live with today in peacetime. Miser's Bluff, Arizona. The American Boeing Corporation simulates a nuclear explosion. The normal assumption is that explosions like this would destroy our highly industrialized society and set us back hundreds of years. But in this experiment, only half a mile away, Boeing had buried some of the equipment which might be needed to start industry working again. In four days, a team of eight men had dug it all up again and reassembled the factory. 
In spite of the closeness of the blast, most of the equipment was astonishingly unscathed. So protecting industry is possible, and the Russians estimate they can limit their civilian casualties to only 5%. Britain's precautions are somewhat further behind. Present planning does not envisage issue of the Anderson-type shelters that were issued in the last war. Now, doubtless, you've been regaled by many tales from your mothers and fathers about the hours they spent in Anderson shelters in the last war. At the Home Defence College at Easingwold near York, a briefing for the men who'll run Britain after the bomb. Well, it's thought that the transition to war, or a possible war, will start with a phase of international tension of some weeks. And during this peri period, such actions as do not appear provocative to an enemy or too disturbing to the general public will be put into effect. And for present planning purposes today, some three to four weeks is allowed for local authorities to implement the war emergency plans. This is the nub of Britain's civil defence policy. Britain's plans are based on the questionable assumption that there'll be at least three or four weeks warning of nuclear attack. During that time, the government intends to print and distribute this booklet to every home in the country. But while the planners are banking on three weeks warning of nuclear attack, Her Majesty's Stationery Office say it'll take at least four weeks just to print the booklet. If you're basing your planning on an assumption that you will get three weeks' warning, I think that's a grave mistake. I mean, I think that given the readiness of modern weapons, for example, one could imagine a nuclear exchange taking place within 48 or 72 hours. It certainly isn't going to take more than 48 to 72 hours to start the Soviet divisions in East Germany rolling westwards. In response to an urgent appeal by the freedom-loving peoples of Western Europe, the Red Army launched attacks to crush provocations by the aggressive NATO forces. By the second day, fraternal forces of the Warsaw Pact, having liberated large areas of West Germany, surged across the River Rhine. A lightning attack with nuclear war possibly only hours away would cut the ground from under Britain's civil defence. We have no plans for this situation. Only the most primitive advice could be issued to our unprotected population. On the third day, remnants of NATO air power launched barbarous and unprincipled bombing attacks on helpless civilian areas. Defeated on all fronts, the imperialists treacherously launched atomic weapons. The socialist camp was reluctantly forced to respond with weapons of huge destructive power. Surviving this depends upon information, and currently Britain's population is among the most ill-informed in Europe. Three days before the feared attack, the government will order the broadcasting authorities to transmit a series of official films telling people what to do. These films are secret, but we have managed to obtain copies of them. They've never been seen before and won't be seen again until nuclear war is imminent. Their advice is intended to be reassuring. The time has now come to make everything ready for you and your family in case an air attack happens. This does not mean that war is bound to come, but there is a risk of this, and we must all be prepared for it. When you hear the attack warning, you and your family must take cover at once. Do not stay out of doors. If you are caught in the open, Lie down. Since it's official policy to inform people only when war is imminent, it's reasonable to ask what 
Armed with this ignorance, people would expect to do. What would you do if you heard a warning? <laughs> Run for it. I, honestly, I don't know. Um, I'd be totally unprepared. Would you know what to do if you heard siren sound? Get out of it. <laughs> what would you do? Um, if I was here, I'd go home and get my kids. And what would you do then? Drive out in the countryside somewhere. It's the time, isn't it? Going anywhere. You bad it, ain't you? Bad it, ain't you? Would you take any preparations at all? What preparations you got? You bad it, ain't you? You bad it, ain't you? No good messing about, is it? You bad it, ain't you? No good messing crying over spilt milk, is it? Well, what could you do? They haven't built shelters for anybody, have they? You've seen what's happened with a nuclear bomb, haven't you? The way it scatters everything, you won't stand a chance. Or you wind up with a lump in your trousers. The advice to stay at home is followed by instructions on how to make a fallout shelter. Here, more cracks begin to appear in Britain's civil defence theories. We asked a Yorkshire family to build a fallout shelter following the government recommended design. They found that it required 100 plastic bags or similar containers, access to a garden, the strength to dig and carry over a tonne of earth, and floor joists strong enough to bear that sort of weight. They and every other family are also advised to buy and take with them enough food to last a fortnight, assuming the shops could meet that sort of sudden demand. This is to be home at least for days and possibly weeks. Do you really think it's wise to bring the dog in with you? Well, with a ten-year-old daughter who thinks the world of the dog, we've no alternative. What do you think conditions will be like mm. in here after a couple of weeks? Pretty good, I would say, but what can you do? If you leave your home, your local authority may take it over for homeless families. And if you move, the authorities in the new place will not help you with food, accommodation or other essentials. You are better off in your own home. Stay there. <laughs> I would call it neglect and die in its present form because I don't think anyone could survive in the cities in makeshift shelters. It's absolutely preposterous to expect anyone to survive under those conditions. But with respect, I mean, the, the government wouldn't publish a book like that unless it had researched into its effectiveness. Well, I, I can tell you that I've worked in civil defence uh, for some 25 years, and the literature that was being churned out in the 50s is practically the same as, as, uh, as we now have in Protect and Survive, this, this idea of uh, upturning a, a table and uh, putting it against a wall and, and surrounding it with cushions and, uh, and painting the windows white and... Um, uh, bringing in enough food to last for a fortnight into the room so you can live in this room for a fortnight. I mean, good heavens, if this building is in the target area and it's shattered, broken in some way, then the fallout dust, which comes down immediately after the explosion in high levels, uh, very heavy dust, the initial stuff that comes down, this will be very, very highly radioactive. It will not be stopped by cushions, it will not be stopped by wood, and the people that are sheltering in that makeshift shelter will certainly be, be, be dead within a few days to a few weeks from radiation sickness. On the outskirts of Geneva, the house of Monsieur Marcel Guy. There's nothing special about Monsieur Guy or about his house. It happens to have a fallout shelter in the basement, but then so does every Swiss home built since 1960. Uh, without getting out, we would stay 14 days in the shelters. And have you got food supplies in there sufficient for 14 days? Yes. As you can see, it's not a. What have you got here then? Well, uh. Oil, sugar, some uh, spaghetti and so on, and uh, frozen food. 
in here. What about the problem of ventilating an area like this with six people in it? You have here the ventilation system, which can be used without the filter which is here, or if necessary, the air would go through the filter. And would that filter remove all radioactivity, for example? In yes, the yes, it will. It's made principally for this. What do you think conditions will be like down here if you had to spend a fortnight? Well, uh, it's not the rich here, but uh, I think that if you have the choice between living outside and die outside and living here, a little uh, in small space, well, you just ch chose to, to live in here. Before any new house is built in Switzerland, shelter plans have to be approved by the local civil defence authority. Half the extra cost is paid by the government, and in another 10 years, there'll be shelters for the entire population. The Swiss government estimates that the whole of their civil defence, including shelters and training people in the basic tasks like firefighting, costs about £10 per head per year. It is, of course, easy for a small, neutral and, above all, wealthy country to believe in civil defence. In this country, the Home Office is now reconsidering Britain's precautions, but here the priorities are different. Why is it that we don't have a shelter policy in this country? Because of the enormous expense. It's simply too expensive? If you're talking about a communal shelter policy, yes. We're talking about billions and billions and billions of pounds. The amount in at the beginning of, of when I took office, uh, spent a year, was £19.8 million. Pounds. And that had been going up in real terms. Uh, sorry, staying the same in real terms. The, am the total amount had been going up. But that's left less than 50 pence per head of the population, isn't it? If you say so, yes. <laughs> well, did... Was it your feeling that that was an adequate figure? Well, it was, it was adequate for the threat that existed at the time. It isn't easy, you know, I think, to have to go to Parliament and have to come to the country and try to provide answers to very difficult questions. But because we believe that this has got to be done, we've embarked on this reveal. If you've embarked upon the review, is that some indication that the government may be prepared to substantially increase the amount of money that's spent on civil defence? This is what we've got to look at when we've had a look at the options which come out of the review. But at any event, we are likely to be talking in terms of increased expenditure, aren't we? I'm not going to burn any boats in answer to that question at the present time. Immediately before an attack on Britain, the telephone lines carrying the speaking clock will be used to activate a network of 7,000 sirens scattered all over the country. Britain's early warning system is based on the three massive radar scanners at Filingdales. It's the home of the four-minute warning. Okay, right to phone. This is the senior duty officer. Confidence report now. Confidence report now. Sorry. UK alarm level one, missile attack. Threat to US imminent. Megaton bomb exploded 7,000 feet above the House of Commons would create a fireball over a mile across, over Piccadilly Circus, Trafalgar Square, the very heart of London. The fireball would last for approximately 10 seconds, 
reaching inside it temperatures of hundreds of thousands of degrees centigrade. Over an area for about a mile down as far as Vauxhall Bridge, there'd be winds of 700 miles an hour. And while some of the more substantial buildings might be left partially standing, they'd have shifted on their foundations. Anything else, any human beings, would have simply vanished. Over the entire centre of London, Oxford Street, Park Lane, Mayfair, Kensington, Camden Town, up as far as the borders of Hampstead, down here on the river over Chelsea and Fulham, because of the intense change in pressure, houses would simply explode, people would disappear. The blast would reach Battersea Bridge within 11 seconds with winds of 180 miles an hour. Out as far as seven miles, that's down through Putney, Hammersmith, Barnes, as far as Kew Bridge. Houses would have their roofs ripped off, doors and windows would be blown in, anybody caught in the open would be blown over, their body covered with blistering second-degree burns. Should major centres of population be hit, the scenes of suffering and devastation will be appalling. Rescuers will only be able to work when there is no threat of radioactive fallout. No one can guess how long it'll be before normal life resumes. But some form of government will survive. There are two guards stationed permanently outside an innocuous bungalow in the home counties, a building so secret we cannot show it. Inside, deep underground, is the seat of government for all of Greater London. Two hundred civil servants, soldiers, policemen and engineers have been designated to come here in time of war. After the attack, they'd attempt to carry on the business of government for weeks, possibly months. In the planners' jargon, this is known as a sub-regional control. Nuclear war will shatter national government. Then the highest level of government will be in the 17 so-called sub-regions in England and Wales, three in Scotland and one in Northern Ireland. It's hoped later to merge England and Wales into ten regions, each under the control of a cabinet minister. But however neat the scheme, two of these secret headquarters aren't yet built, and in North Wales the Home Office hasn't even found a site around which to plan. In the existing sub-regional bunkers, government will be one man. This is the only private accommodation in the place, an iron bed, a desk, a telephone. It's the office of the man who'll be known as the Commissioner. He'll be a junior minister, someone of the rank of Timothy Raisin or Reg Prentice. By the time this office is occupied, Britain may be only hours away from nuclear attack. From this desk, the Commissioner, backed up by a team of Whitehall civil servants, will attempt to control what's left of the population of Greater London. Across the country, there'll be another 16 such commissioners, all of them with theoretical control over the police and the army, all of them effectively with the power of life or death. For weeks, the 200 civil servants will have to remain in the sub-regional control, working as best they can. While they'll be provided with the basic necessities, a bed and food, they'll be expected to work in the full knowledge that their families on the surface have only the protection afforded them by their hastily homemade shelters. The situation there has been made the more difficult because of those folk who have ignored government requests to stay in their homes and who have flooded into the county. Um, and if we get the... But central government plans may be wildly optimistic. In the early stages after nuclear attack, the highest level of government 
may be at no more than local authority level. In the Humberside County Council bunker just outside Hull, local government, police and fire officers, soldiers and ladies from the WRVS are briefed by the chief executive, in wartime known as the controller. Today, down here, there's a war going on. The, uh, we've had, because of the way in which the government has played down things, people haven't purchased food for 14 days, and I guess that was probably not more than 25% of the population have got their 14 day supplies. The food shops are strict. We're trying to get as much food into the county as we can, and we have managed to provision the emergency uh, headquarters and standby points for police and fire. Uh, but these, as far as the ordinary people are concerned, it's very tough. Oh my gosh. Well, it's academic. Oh, no. Really? Oh, really? Is that Gould District? Have you got a bearing on the bomb that's dropped near Hull? You have? 81 degrees. Fine, thank you. Another one, 198. There was more than one surprise in this exercise. In addition to the expected attack on the RAF base at Finningley, there was a second strike against Hull itself, a civilian target, but because of its port, of strategic importance. Volunteer, unpaid scientific advisers are expected to produce information on which decisions can be made. By the cloud formation, it's about a me one megaton size bomb. Well. Brown burst, Mr. Right, 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 smack bang in the middle of hot. Yes. Yeah. So, we well, should be calculating the blast rings shortly, Mr. Controller, to explain there's going to be extensive damage. Most of the inner city, that total city of Hull, I think, would be demolished at greater size. From what we know now, um, the fallout plume is going to go out towards the east coast, somewhere between Hornsea and Widensea, no, as the main area of Hind high-risk fallout. Uh, Is that just from the Finningley bombs? No, no, the winds, no, the winds no, are all blowing no. in that direction. The no, Finningley bomb, we well, if it's, if it's Finningley, we're not sure yet. We haven't got a cross-reference on there. We haven't got a confirmation on that, but it's somewhere well, down there are in that other area. bombs in this area? Yes, there's certainly another bomb down there somewhere. Uh, Can you give any time when the fallout... Yes. Uh, what we're forecasting is this? Within an hour. Within an hour. Within an hour. Bomb is a ground buster and air burst. We don't, we don't, yeah, we don't no, really know the full details the of the, the bomb down there. We're just guessing that it's Finningley at the moment. It's pretty conclusive about the whole bomb being a ground burst, Mr. Controller, because outside, what? I'm sad to say, gentlemen, but all our cars are a charcoal brown colour and all our windscreens are gone and adjacent housing around the station is on fire. There's a multitude of trees that have been demolished. So we're positive it's a ground burst weapon, a one megaton size. So there's extreme damage outside of this control station. So this would explain why we felt the station shake at the time of the explosion. And um, this would mean that there's very little that one can do for Hull or its residents. Yeah, no. In the end, it comes down to one man, a man with more power than he could ever have imagined, even in his grossest dreams or nightmares. Keith Bridge, a former accountant. How much power do you have as controller? As soon as the bomb goes off, total power, theoretically. That would include power over the police, fire brigade, all that sort of thing? Yes, and life and death. Powers of life and death? Yes. What does that mean? That if people were looting, it would be um, within my competence to instruct that they'd be executed. Would you expect that kind of situation to arise? It's quite possible. It's feasible. Does having that kind of uh, power, total power, worry you? No. Not at all? No. If anyone dies while you are kept in your fallout room, move the body to another room in the house. Label the body with name and address and cover it as tightly as possible in polythene, paper, sheets or blankets. Tie a second card to the covering. The radio will advise you what to do about taking the body away for burial. If, however, you have had a body in the house for more than five days, and if it is safe to go outside, then you should bury the body for the time being in a trench or cover it with earth and mark the spot of the burial. You will remember that we started off with a population.
In the exercise at Hull, it's now supposed to be 14 days since the attack. The, the, of course, the problem with the dead is quite a serious one. And as we're moving into the urban areas, then, of course, we're, in, uh, we're covering uh, uh, under... We are um, opening up quite a lot of uh, places where, in fact, we're finding various bodies. Um, what, are, what we are doing is that we are running a, a system of collection um, and anybody, indeed, who has uh, relatives or uh, friends who, who are dead, then what we would ask them to do is to place them at the side of the roads that we've cleared, and twice a day we are making a collection round and then disposing of those bodies in mass graves. By now, law and order would be a serious problem. A message for the controller. A group of 30 survivors is heading for his headquarters demanding food. They'd already killed and looted and were heavily armed, although four of their number had been captured by police. I was concerned before, you know, when, when the police chief gave his report, he, he seemed a bit too confident to me about law and order. I thought the situation was probably not as... Uh, steady as we uh, were given to believe, you know, and this is typical of the sort of thing that can blow up at any time. Will, well, it, be, will it be in a position to head, head him off? Or well, we must ask the police to try and head them off. We're using the military if they can. This building must be secured so that nobody can get in here and make a thundering nuisance of themselves. I think you've got to be quite draconian in whatever punishments you choose to meet out, sir, and that may mean the ultimate sanction at the end of the day. You'll have to be advised by the police on that. Will you come here, please, Chief? Uh, have you seen this note? Copy of it, yes. You've got a copy of it. Can you tell us your, give us your advice, please, as to the way in which we ought to respond? Yes, yeah, so if the if these men, uh, obviously, we were going to involve the army with this if we possibly can, because uh, if it uh, means using weapons, I'd rather the army personnel use the weapons in the first instance than we have to do. Well, Mr. Bridge, how many army personnel have we got in this vicinity? I mean. Well, you must ask the major that, sir, because they have other duties than looking after us, I think. Well, that's what I would have thought. But surely, Chairman, this is an emergency situation. It is we indeed. We utilise what we have on the ground at this moment. Into and will you make sure that sufficient of your men are armed so that, if need be, they can take a sanction to themselves? I take it, Chairman, that the Army, of course, will be alerted as well to oh, yes, this. But of course, this could escalate. Yeah, Unless we worry. stop it now, yeah, this could escalate, and these 30 worry. we can find to be a large a larger group by the time they get to warm, because we... obviously survival is the big thing in their mind. No, I would be grateful if you get on with it. Would you liaise with the, with the army? Certainly. Thank you. What about the four that, you've, that have been arrested, effectively? The police will sort that out, and they will come back to me in, in due season, but I suspect that the, that the conclusion will be, since that we have no effective means of restraining people in this situation, some of the views of the emergency committee, I think we may impose the ultimate sanction at the end of the day. Could I ask what, shoot them? Yes. Each emergency control is equipped with its own radio station maintained by the BBC. After the war, the BBC would become WTBS, Wartime Broadcasting Service. Its job, and the job of all the media, to act this as an arm of government. For Humberside, Keith Bridge. I'm speaking from the county's main headquarters at Warn. This is an official broadcast, and I will be telling you what you must do in the days ahead. Among the many dangers now facing us are rumour and panic. We can and we will survive, but only if you listen to these instructions and follow them to the letter. First of all, the war is over. There will be no more bombs. How difficult a position would it be for you to be in your shelter here and know that your family were outside? Very difficult indeed. I should have very divided loyalties. Which way would you jump? I can't possibly answer, answer that until the situation arises. Theoretically, I should have no problems. I should be here. Would you envisage it as a problem as regards other staff? Oh, yes. Without doubt. What do you think would happen? That many of them wouldn't be here. I think we can take some credit here. For the issue so even well-prepared local authorities like Humberside might find themselves yes. unable to cope. The highest level of organisation then might be at no more than street or parish. And here there are hardly any plans and no government money available. The Home Office is relying on volunteers, taking as their model the warning organisation, the Royal Observer Corps. 
you are in fact mobilizing 10,000 people, although you've only got a permanent cadre of 70 full-time officers. I think this is the way to go about uh, arranging our civil defense, at least in time of peace. But in time of war, it may be too late. Well, uh, it's when the unthinkable moment may happen, when a nuclear onset may come, that it is then possible to get those who are volunteers to spring into full-time action. And let's face it, we've seen this happen before, and it can happen again. This is the uh, lightweight survey uh, radiac instrument to measure the radiation. So in the end, um, each in local community will have to help itself. Um, in Devon, like volunteers are training in the use of radiation meters. Spot on the zero, just sort of move it around a little bit and bring it up to the zero position. Many of the Devon emergency volunteers are former members of the Civil Defence Corps and bitterly regret its passing. I really did believe in civil defence. I went round instructing people and persuading them to join civil defence, telling them that civil defence was necessary. And then suddenly civil defence wasn't considered to be necessary and we all had egg on our faces. Do you believe that this kind of organisation is necessary now? Vital. Absolutely vital. And the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Meet Major Tony Hibbert, leader of his own breakaway organisation. It may not look like a World War III battlefield, but today Major Hibbert, Dick, George, Amanda and Margaret are preparing for a radiation cloud hitting a nearby hamlet. Zero reading. Good. Now check for clothing. Just tighten this up. Okay, let's just check for... We're getting a reading, a positive reading, fallout arrival, check time, fallout arrival, 12.25. Dick, I want you to fire the maroons now, please. Three whistles, or bangs, is the warning for radiation. looks funny now. Remember, after an attack, it may be all we have. Good luck to both of you. Fallout can kill, though you cannot see it, feel it, or smell it. There is danger outside, so don't go outside. Stay in your fallout room until you are told it is safe to come out. This is the last tin of beans, uh, Trevor. Can you pass okay. that, please? Yeah. 
glad to share it out with the full bleach. For most, the real world after the bomb would be a grim business. After two weeks, food would be almost exhausted. There are over 100 government emergency food warehouses in Britain, but although stocked with essential foodstuffs, they don't add up to a balanced diet and it might take three months to replenish them from elsewhere. The world will be changed utterly. In spite of the belief that mass bombing would make war impossible or that it would end civilization, by the time the Second World War began, there was a full-scale national organization dedicated to civil defense. No time now for asking what to do, where to go. No time now for further training and organization. The hour of trial is upon us. Forty years later, we are far worse off. Today, civil defence in Britain is little more than a pile of paper. There is no national civil defence force, no evacuation plan, no civilian shelters, inadequate food stocks, general unpreparedness, and a feeling that civil defence is simply too expensive. If war were to break out between NATO and the Warsaw Pact, Britain would certainly be a target. The government is currently considering plans to spend £5,000 million developing new ways of delivering nuclear weapons to the enemy. Last year we spent 20 millions protecting the population in whose name the missiles would be fired. If we are concerned to defend the values that, that we have in this country, we want to convince anyone who might wish to take those things away from us uh, that we'll fight. Now, if it, the only alternative is to nuclear, use nuclear weapons or lie down and sham dead, uh, that is, is an uncomfortable choice. If, on the other hand, we've shown that we're serious about our mean, mean, meaning to defend, and civil defense is a part of that, then I think we should do it. For that reason, almost alone, as indicating will, intention, moral fiber, call it what you like. Because otherwise, people may not, in the end, believe the threats that we make. It's extremely difficult to know to what extent you can increase the rate of people surviving by an increase in the expenditure of money. But if we're considering spending something like five billion pounds on the next generation of independent deterrent, isn't it uh, somewhat absurd to only spend 20 million pounds on protecting the people in whose name those missiles will be fired. Well, look, it is precisely because these questions are being asked and the government realises that answers must be provided that we are holding the review that we are. At the moment, it's... We're back to the old British uh, uh, system of, of ad, ad hocery, really, uh, of hoping for the best. And uh, I, I think in, in, mo in modern terms, in terms of modern weapons, um, we just cannot muddle through as, we, as we've muddled through in the past. It just won't work. And uh, our plans at the moment exist purely allowing us to muddle through and nothing else. And if we aren't able to muddle through? And if we aren't ab able to muddle through, then we'll descend into complete and utter chaos and anarchy. And that would be the end of everything.
likely target for attack, we must think about the unthinkable if the bomb drops. After a nuclear war, the whole of Europe could become a vast, uninhabitable desert. No industrial society, nothing that we would recognize as government, would survive. There would be a state of total anarchy, with all those who remained alive prey to bands of savage marauders with disease rampant and violent death commonplace. In an all-out nuclear war, to use the word survival is idiotic. The apocalyptic words of General Sir John Hackett, former commander-in-chief of NATO's Northern Army Group. A catastrophe with untold loss of life, an inferno from which there will be no recovery. In the popular mind, if the results of nuclear war are to be so awesomely destructive, there is nothing to be gained by preparing for survival afterwards. For 12 years, civil defence equipment has lain in warehouses gathering dust. So too have fresh thoughts about our survival. If war came tomorrow, most of us would die. With better preparations, most of us could survive. If uh, people were adequately informed and could take adequate preparations, uh, I think you could reduce your casualty level to about 30%. In other words, we'd have something like 7, 65, 70% survivors. And it's those people that we've got to do something about. And that's the whole raison d'etre for civil defence. It's no good having weapons to fight for the freedom of the West. And while our boys are dying at the front, the last thought they have is that the people back home are not going to survive either. So what's the point of the whole bloody mess? <laughs> The belief that the next war will be the last one isn't new. H.G. Wells's 1936 film, Things to Come, reflected contemporary military thinking when it showed the bomber as the ultimate weapon of destruction. Please keep still and listen. War has broken out suddenly. There may be an air raid. The streets will be dangerous. Do not assemble in crowds. Keep indoors. Go home. Those who are far from home can take refuge in the underground railways. Go home! Go home! Go home! Get out of the square! Get out of the streets! Go home! Go home. Go home. Go home. Go home. The film caused panic in the streets. Four years later, when these scenes had become a reality, many of those who took to the shelters did so believing it was the end of civilization. They were wrong. So too was the belief that such powerful weapons could so frighten politicians that war could be prevented. Today, after Afghanistan, the doomsday clock of the Association of Atomic Scientists stands at seven minutes to midnight, closer to nuclear war than at any time since the two superpowers gained the bomb. The Soviet Union appears to believe that her civil defence programme means that most of her people could survive. It's yet another undermining of the delicate... Seconds. Twenty... Good evening. The bomb isn't likely to drop, certainly not in the near future. Although the Russian invasion of Afghanistan has heightened tension between East and West, few believe that a nuclear war is imminent. But what the Afghan crisis has made us do is examine what preparations have been made to enable you and me, as opposed to government, to survive a nuclear attack. 
Britain's Civil Defence Corps was disbanded in 1968, and since then most people seem to have wanted to avoid the subject altogether. They think either that there'll be no nuclear war, or that no one will survive it. Both assumptions are questionable. In this film, we've attempted to find out how many could survive a nuclear attack, what life would be like after such a catastrophe, and what's being done to help us survive. You may find some of this film disturbing, but as long as we remain a like balance of terror, known as mutually assured destruction, it seems that the Russians do not accept at least the mutual part of assured destruction. Because what mutual assured destruction meant as a theory was that you, in a sense, bared your breast to the enemy. You took no defensive measures. You accepted the fact that you remained absolutely vulnerable to his attack. And then there would be an element of stability, because if he had enough weapons to attack you being vulnerable, and you had enough weapons to attack him being vulnerable, there was a, a deterrent mechanism at work. The trouble is the Russians didn't seem to accept this part of the doctrine, and so they have developed a substantial civil defense program. They clearly think that they might come to the point of a strategic nuclear exchange, and then, if that were so, they want to lose less badly than the United States. Today, the nuclear arsenals are bigger than they've ever been, an average of three tons of high explosive for every man, woman, and child on Earth. Many would agree that the greater the number of weapons, the greater the chance of their being used. In a small, overcrowded island like ours, is there any point in trying to protect ourselves? How many of the missiles might be targeted on Britain? So I think that they would be looking at something like as high as 200 targets in the United Kingdom, and perhaps allocating nearly as many as 400 weapons to the destruction of those targets, given that they won't all, all go off or work. So, I mean, if I took a map of the United Kingdom and I put pins in for all the military targets, which I think they would be interested in, there would not be many parts of the United Kingdom which would not have pins in them. On August the 6th, 1945, an American plane dropped a bomb called Little Boy on the city of Hiroshima. Even now, people are dying from the after-effects of that explosion. Today, weapons are a thousand times more powerful. The common view is that if we don't all die immediately, radiation will kill us painfully over the years. Bruce Sibley is a scientist who has studied ways of coping with radiation. I can tell you that all of the data in the last three decades convinces me that although there will be catastrophic damage in the cities and that millions of people will die as a result of the initial effects of the weapon and the initial radiation, long-term wise, over the, over the decades that we have to survive and build a new society, people will be able to um, grow food on contaminated land and monitor it carefully and keep that level down that goes into the bodies and minimize the number of deaths that will occur over the decades as regards increases in leukemia, cancer, and um, genetic um, births and things like this. I mean, the sort of proportions we're talking about um, are rather similar to what we live with every day of our lives in peacetime. We, we don't worry about deaths on the road. We don't worry about, uh, we don't appear to worry about deaths on the road. We don't appear to worry about accidents in the hospitals, uh, that cases coming into the hospitals, people have been killed um, in, in work, um, people who are dying in hospital from <laughs> smoking. Uh, all of these statistics we live with every day of our lives. And yet once we start to talk about nuclear war casualties in the aftermath point where people are...